other men that I have known and many I forgot and there are those I can't forget my mind is always stopped when I remember those special friends God bless me with some way and I'm thinking of one right now He's with the Savior and with heaven I say My friend was a godly man He loved his family true He loved the Lord with his whole heart his wife, son, and daughters, too. His smile reflected the Father's grace, so gentle and so kind. Now, as I remember him, what a dear, dear friend of mine. Broken hearts never fully mend on this side of heaven. So when the Savior's love defend and never be shaken. For the example of my friend was that God's love is always enough. To walk you through the darkest times And I know he's smiling above My friend was a godly man He loved his family true He loved the Lord with his whole heart his wife, son, and daughters, too. His smile reflected the Father's grace, so gentle and so kind. And now, as I remember him, what a dear, dear friend of mine. So my friend alive today though he's really in heaven when I saw his family looked into their eyes I saw him walking within their hearts his faith alive in their souls God's peace surrounded them in the comfort of heavenly hope. My friend was a godly man. He loved his family true. He loved the Lord with his whole heart. His wife, son, and daughter too. His smile reflected the Father's grace, so gentle and so kind. And now as I remember him, what a dear, dear friend of mine. Yes, my friend was a godly man. His family true. He loved the Lord with his whole heart. Becky, see Rachel is who they do. His smile reflected the Father's grace, so gentle and so kind. And now, as I remember him, what a dear. Good morning. I hope
that you enjoyed the song that I wrote for my friend's family years ago. Shall we look to the Lord? Our God and our Father, we thank you for your love, grace, and mercy. Our God and our Father, we thank you that we know him, that went into death for us and rose again the third day, that we can face death in every other situation of life, knowing that through him we have victory. Help us now as we open your word. For his worthy name's sake we pray. Amen. This uh, is called Dev David, the Shepherd King, number 28. Honorable eulogy. Honorable eulogy. Death is always difficult and beset with sorrow. But thankfully, the death of a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is not beset with the same sorrow as the world. Paul encouraged the Thessalonian believers who had lost loved ones who were in Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 Sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. The world stands at the grave of the one who never professed Jesus Christ as Lord. And their weeping is only muted by the illusionary promise that their loved one is in a better place. After all, when did you ever go to a funeral and it was announced that the dead one was in hell? It doesn't happen. They are always and somehow in a better place. But those who sorrow for loved ones who have died in Christ have a real reason not to sorrow as a world without hope. For a believer's hope rests not in an illusionary promise formulated in the unbelieving heart of a man, but in the sure word of God. Hallelujah. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 8 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What a blessed hope. And we are to be looking for that blessed hope of our Lord Jesus' return every moment. Titus 2.13. Amen. But tragically, Saul's death was not a hopeful one. Nevertheless, in a moment, David will show us how to properly eulogize those outside the family of faith. But first, there is the announcement of Saul and Jonathan, Jonathan's death. 2 Samuel 1, 1 through 10. Now it came to pass after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had abode two days in Ziklag. It came to pass on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent, earth upon his head. And so it was, when he came to David, he fell to the earth and did obeisance. And David said unto him, From whence comest thou? And he said unto him, Out of the camp of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, How went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered that the people are fled from the battle, and many of the people also are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. And David said unto the young man that told him, How knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, be dead? And the young man that told him said, As I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul leaned upon his spear, and lo, the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called unto me. And I answered, Here am I. And he said unto me, Who art thou? And I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said unto me again, Stand, I pray thee, upon me and slay me, for anguish is upon me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood upon him and slew him, because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was upon his head and the bracelet that was upon his arm and have brought them hither unto my Lord. I'm sure all of us have seen the devastation done by some natural disaster, a hurricane, a tornado, a fire, an earthquake, or a tsunami. It is heartbreaking to watch people rummage through the rubble of what was once their personal belongings. This was the dilemma of David and his men as they returned with their wives and children to the burned ruins of Ziklag. For two days, they camped in the midst of the ashes that was once their community. Sometimes God speaks in a still, small voice. And at other times, his voice thunders. It was time for David to move from his Philistine home of the far country and to begin his kingship. 
And God delivered this message to David with the torch of the Amalekites, and he confirmed it with the death of Saul. And of all the people to deliver the message of Saul and Jonathan's death, it was an Amalekite. There is a saying, fools go where angels fear to tread. This Amalekite has no idea. He's walking into a burned village, and he doesn't know that his own people had burned it. I can almost hear him asking, hey guys, did you all have a fire? Anyway, the man bows to David. But now that David is back in fellowship with God, his spiritual intuitions are back also. He understands that a man of God must be as wise as a serpent. Matthew 10, 16. David has been a phony for a year and six months in the land of the Philistines. He has played the pretend game, and he can recognize a pretender. So David begins to inquire of this man. Here's a loose summary of the man's answers. I was out for a walk, and by chance I came upon a battle that Israel was losing. And as I walked through the battle, I saw Saul, who was wounded and dying. I told him I was an Amalekite, and he asked me to take a sword and end his life. So now Saul is dead and Jonathan too. After I killed Saul, I stripped him of his crown and bracelet. I then escaped out of the camp of Israel during the heat of the battle, carrying Saul's crown and bracelet, which I now present to you, my Lord David. Please honor me now for having disposed of your enemy. It doesn't take a PhD in criminal law to discern that this fellow's story is fraught with holes. This Amalekite had no doubt been scavenging amongst the dead after the battle. He came upon Saul already dead. We know this because Saul's armor bearer only took his own life after Saul was dead, 1 Samuel 31, 5. This vulturous Amalekite was no doubt out early in the morning ahead of the Philistines. Coming upon Saul, he stripped him of his crown and bracelet. But this Amalekite, like all men and women without the Spirit of God, had no idea how godly men behave. He assumed David would honor him for having dealt with his enemy Saul. But when David and his men recognized Saul's crown and bracelet, they were overcome with sorrowful emotion. Verse 11, Then David took hold on his clothes and rent them, and likewise all the men that were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord, and for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. From the cross, the Lord Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 34. He did not have enmity toward those that opposed him, but love. The riches of God's love mingled with the depths of his sorrow filled the Savior's heart. His arms were opened in love and grace to receive sinful men and women. And his heart was broken that they would not come. He was the Messiah of Israel, but the nation received him not. John 1, 11. Here the Messiah is mourning over his people's unbelief. Luke 13, 34. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Before commenting upon this verse, let's remember that the Bible often uses symbolism which is centered in nature. This is because all creation is a veiled revelation of its wise designer. And so it is with every human art form, too. The art is an expression of the artist. All creation then contains spiritual messages from its architect. For instance, God's supremacy is seen in the planet, planets orbiting the sun. And it is seen at every sunrise when all the subordinate celestial bodies seemingly withdraw from view. Psalm 19.4 Also, God is the source of life so that all vegetation grows toward the sun, even as the plant cannot exist without the sunlight and the resulting photosynthesis. In God's divine order, life feeds on death. 
Every time we eat a hamburger, a slice of bacon, or visit KFC, our lives have been fed by the death of another. And this, of course, is a picture of the Lord Jesus' death, ministering life to all that believe in him. So it is important to keep in mind that nature itself is a lesson book that can help us learn more of God and his wonderful ways. And what an awesome harvest awaits any believer who is willing to labor in God's library of wonders. And should it not be expected that God's truth is to be found in all he has made? And one of the greatest of these truths is that our creator God desires to communicate with his fallen creation. The creator has ascribed to himself the title, the word, John 1, 1 and 3. God uses language of words to express himself to the world. God uses the language of words to express himself in creation. Psalm 19, 1 through 3. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. God uses the language of words to express himself in the Bible. 2 Timothy 3:16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. This verse literally means all scripture is God breathed. And therefore God is found in every word of it. And finally, God uses the language of words to express himself in Christ. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1, God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us in the person of the Son. Revelation 19, 13, referring to the Lord Jesus, and his name is called the Word of God. And all this clearly evidences that God is a communicator, and he communicates that we can know him. He is a God of relationship, and God desires a relationship with the creation he has made even as he has enjoyed an eternal relationship within the persons of the Godhead. Mystery of mysteries. So when the Lord Jesus, the creator, likens himself to a mother hen who lifts her wing to receive her endangered chicks, he is simply revealing a spiritual truth which he purposed in the hen from creation. In other words, the mother hen is the Lord Jesus' representative preacher throughout the world. Whenever and wherever a mother hen lifts her wing, inviting her brood to come under the wing of her protection, she is preaching the message of God's love in Christ. Glory. And why did we take this somewhat curious roundabout when speaking of David and his sorrow when confronted with the evidence of Saul's death? Because David and Ziklag is a dim picture of the Savior. For David, Saul's death was not the death of an enemy to be cheered, but the passing of the anointed of the Lord to be mourned. His heart was broken for Saul. For even after all the years of fleeing him, David still had love, respect, and compassion for Saul. The Lord Jesus had ministered God's love and grace to Israel for three and a half years. Yet even though they had despised and rejected him, his love toward them did not, could not diminish. He wept over Jerusalem when he overlooked the city from the Mount of Olives. And every tear was a precious expression of his sorrow and love mingled. The Amalekite must have been very confused by this quite unanticipated response by David. Why was David weeping? His enemy was dead. This Amalekite would have done well to forget his expectation of reward and to quietly slip away. But just as God's thoughts and ways are not the ways of men, Isaiah 55, 8, so it is with God's people. John 3, 1. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. 1 Corinthians 2.14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, 
for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But this Amalekite lingered too long at the well because after the distress of the initial news had passed, David's attention turned back to this man who by his own admission had slain God's anointed king. And he who had come to David for reward was rewarded, though not at all as he had hoped. 2 Samuel 1, 14 through 16, David said unto him, How wast thou not afraid to stretch forth thy hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. And David said unto him, Thy blood be upon thy head, for thy mouth hath testified against thee, saying, I have slain the Lord's anointed. Now, even though we believe that this Amalekite came upon Saul after he was dead, Nevertheless, there is a biblical principle as to the accountability for the words we speak. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. But I say unto you that every idle word that a man shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. David said to the Amalekite, For thy mouth hath testified against thee. May we all take this principle to heart and practice being swift to hear and slow to speak. James 1.19. Amen. And now the heart of the sweet, though sorrowing psalmist of Israel overflows with this anguishing eulogy. Verse 17, And David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son. Also, he bade them teach the children of Judah to use the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jaser. The beauty of Israel is slain upon thine high places. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ascalon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Ye mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew, neither let there be no rain upon you, nor fields of offerings, for there the shield of the mighty is vilely cast away, the shield of Saul, as though he had not been anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan turned not back, and the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives, and in their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. Ye daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet with other delights, who put on ornaments of gold upon your apparel. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? O Jonathan, thou wast slain in thine high places. I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful, surpassing the love of women. How are the mighty fallen and the weapons of war perished? How can we reconcile so lofty, so favorable, so honorable words from David regarding the man that relentlessly pursued him and for years sought to kill him? I believe the answer is discovered in God's first description of David, a man after his own heart, 1 Samuel 13, 14. In mercy, David had completely forgiven Saul. How beautiful and yet challenging an example for us all. And notice how David eulogizes the unbelieving Saul. He only speaks good of him, leaving his soul's eternal destiny to God. This does not mean that we are to be dishonest at the graveside, as is so often the case. What great harm is done to the gospel message when men and women with no confession of Christ are nevertheless announced by the preacher to be in heaven? David shows us the most fitting words when facing the unbeliever's coffin, words of love and grace. We should remember what is commendable in the person's life. Leave their eternal destiny with God and unashamedly preach the gospel of Christ. Amen. Now notice how guarded David was that the deaths of Saul and Jonathan should not be used as an occasion for a victory celebration by the adversary. 
verse 20, tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Escalon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. How often the fall of a believer is publicized amongst unbelievers, and that by those in the church. How shameful. Such conduct only serves to give the enemy fresh fodder for the slander of Christ and his people. Remember, there is only one Christ, and he has only one church of which every believer has part. When there is failure in the church, every believer should sorrow. We should realize that dishonor has been done to the church's head, who is Christ, and to the church's testimony. Amen. We read in 1 Peter 4 through 8, Above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. For a long time I wondered what exactly that meant. How could the love of believers toward one another cover sins? But covering sins is not forgiving sins. Only the blood of Christ is the propitiation for sins. I think the correct understanding of this verse is illustrated in the failure of Noah and his son's responses to it. Genesis 9, 20 through 23. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken. He was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. Ham looked upon his father's nakedness with contempt. And then he maliciously recounted to his brothers the damaging report. As heaven looked down upon the sad, sad scene, Ham was drawing attention to Noah's failure and publicizing it. Ham, as it were, was uncovering his father's sin. But having heard the evil report, Shem and Japheth immediately acted in love, respect, and devotion to their father. They covered his nakedness while carefully not looking upon it. And herein is the sense that the love of others can cover sins. As heaven looked upon the ministry of Shem and Japheth, their actions of love and mercy toward their father became heaven's focus and not Noah's failure. And as we read the account, I believe it is the activity of honor, love, and mercy to which our attention is directed as well. May we all take note. Amen. And then there are David's heartfelt words for his most dear friend. Jonathan never envied David as his father had. On the contrary, Jonathan honored David from the beginning of their meeting. Jonathan, we remember, was a valiant warrior and a man of faith who with his armor bearer had fought and defeated a Philistine garrison. So when Jonathan saw David bring down Goliath in the Valley of Elah, he was like all of us who know the story captivated by David's faith and bravery. Jonathan did not see in David a shepherd boy, but one greater than he. So Jonathan took off his royal garments and gave them with his weapons to David. All that was of value to Jonathan, he surrendered to David. This is indeed honor. Enduring Christian friendships must begin in God and be clothed with honor. Amen. Jonathan honored David more, too. His devotion to David was greater even than to his father. And neither his father's hatred of David nor Saul's madness in his disapproval of Jonathan's friendship interfered with Jonathan's love for his friend. Unfortunately, the true meaning of David's words of love and praise for Jonathan has been violently misrepresented by some. Verse 26, I am distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me is, was wonderful, passing the love of women. On both sides of this verse, verse 25 and 27, David laments, how are the mighty fallen? This is the language of battle. Both David and Jonathan were warriors for Jehovah and his people Israel. They were kindred spirits on God's battlefield. 
In warfare, you must trust implicitly in your fellow soldier. And if this fellow soldier is your best friend, who has even before risked his life for you, there is a bond between you and he and ocean deep. And so it was with David and Jonathan. And it should be added that David never knew what a good marriage was. He was continually multiplying wives. It is sure that David never found in any woman the love and devotion that he had found in his dear friend Jonathan. How privileged we are when we can say that we have enjoyed both the love of a godly wife and the love of a godly friend. Amen. And yet there is one whose love infinitely surpasses the love both of women and of men, the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation 1, 5, unto him that loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Our God and our Father, we thank and praise thee that thou has given us thy love in Christ and that thou has given us other brothers and sisters to walk with, to be friends with, uh, to yield uh, even our lives for if we be called upon. We thank thee, O God, for David and his friendship with Jonathan. We thank thee for his godly way in which he uh, spoke of Saul, totally forgiving him how he eulogized him in the most uh, honorable way. We thank thee for what a man he was. May we emulate him as we follow our Lord Jesus, who is the true author and finisher of faith. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.